Good morning. Uh, one of the great things about YouTube is that you can interact with people you really usually wouldn't interact with, um, you know, in your day-to-day -day life. <coughs> and there was a video that a man named Dan Pepper, that's his screen name, posted about uh, the quote-unquote Jewish takeover of parts of England. And it was just a news report about the construction of an A roof. And there was a comment there about, you know, people should look up at the, the Zionist uh, agenda, George Soros and the Rothschilds and so forth. And so I put a comment there. I said, you know, if you can't compare anything, I, this isn't exactly what I said, but you can't compare anything to, uh, between George Soros and these Hasidic Jews in England, George Soros is an evil man, he's a, he's a Nazi sympathizer, and he hates these pious Jews in this video. And other comments I posted there pointed out that these ultra-Orthodox Jews are anti-Zionists. <coughs> Excuse me. So a gentleman named Stuart Crossland, he asked the following question. He said, so then that begs the question, first of all, how can a Jew be a Nazi sympathizer? And then... He takes, which is a decent question, and I think a, a fair and valid question, which I feel I do want to answer. But then he goes, he takes a little bit of a leap, and he asks, were the, were the Jews, the Jews, uh, beh really behind World War II? Now I would type an answer, but I think it's probably better to make a video, first of all, because I'm driving, so I can't type. Uh, so I could use voice recognition software, but that also requires me to look at the screen. And this I can post without looking at the screen. I can keep my eyes on the road uh, on my way to work, working hard, uh, in addition to trying to do a little bit on YouTube here and there. So those are the two questions. Can a Jew be a Nazi sympathizer? And can... Uh, and were the Jews behind World War II? Um... But I really want to reflect on another video that's become very popular recently, a Rabbi Ben Porat in the Holy Land. I don't want to say he's in Israel because he's obviously a pious Jew. He's not the typical Israeli. Um, and this was something that Rabbi Yaron Ruvay, who, although I might have disagreed with him about how he handled, not necessarily his feelings about this whole story with the... I don't remember the name of the guy, but I made a video about it some time ago. Um, certainly uncomfortable how the whole story was handled, but that doesn't mean, like I said in my, uh, not my last video, but the video I made on Friday, I make so many videos, thank God. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, usually I'm blowing my nose, now I'm coughing. I hope I make it to this wedding on time. I want to maybe make a video just about this wedding and maybe of the wedding. I'm going to see what happens. In any event, the... Um, this video from this Rabbi Ben Parat, which Rabbi Ruvain, uh, yeah, Ron Ruvain shared, and I really appreciate what he had to share there, and I... I, I agree with him. I kind of fell asleep watching the video last night, and it was in Hebrew, so like, I can understand it without looking at the subtitles, but I was, it had subtitles, so I appreciate um, But basically, I mean, it's a rather simplistic video. It's not a deep-thinking video, but it is true um, that this Rabbi Ben Porat goes through Mein Kampf, and he also compares to Wagner, the, the great composer, who was, you know, basically banned in Israel. You know, I remember, I don't know, some time ago on, uh, on what's the name that's, that's, that show the, the, the guys from Seinfeld made? Uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. So uh, Larry David was walking along singing Wagner, and someone came up to me and said, you're a self-hating Jew, Larry. And, and then he said, I, I might hate myself, but it has nothing to do with being Jewish. Um, but it's interesting how if 
if a religious person points out that secular Jews are self-hating Jews, then you know we get in trouble. All these things, but the, but the, not, the Zionists, if they call someone else, you know, for something that's nothing to do with being Jewish or Judaism, and they call someone a self-hating Jew, uh, that's that's okay. Um, so in this video, this Rabbi Ben Porat goes throughout Mein Kampf and through uh, some of the quotes from Wagner about how really as much as these people disliked religious Jews and there was a certain fervor against religious Jews particularly um, but Hitler and Wagner both saw the real threat that they felt that God had sent them to eradicate were the communists. <clears throat> and they were right about that. Uh, just like we said before, evil people can be right sometimes. And my dear friend Rabbi Asher Meza points this out very often. This is probably one of his most controversial statements, but one that's absolutely true. That um, you know, the communists, I'm not going to say exactly what he said, because it could get me into a lot of trouble, uh, but essentially, and I don't know if he ever made a video like this, so I'll, I'll keep it to myself, but essentially, everybody knows, it's, it's common sense that the, not, that the communists are much worse than the Nazis. The communists killed far more millions of people than the Nazis killed, and so... I'm not going to go on with the logical conclusion from that. But the fact of the matter is, though, the truth is, is that Nazis and commies are really just two sides of the same coin. They're kind of two prongs, two branches from the same one branch that, like we've said before, like we've discussed, you know, the similarities between what we have in America, the alt-right, and the extremist left <coughs> are really just two sides of the same coin. And it's, it could almost be compared to the difference between, you know, Lenin and uh, Trotsky. You know, how they were just fighting over the same, you know, little crumbs or whatever. Uh, but the thing is, is that pious Jews were also the victims of the communists. And the communists were much worse than the Nazis. And the Nazis were really bad. Obviously, the worst thing you could call someone is a Nazi. But really, it should be worse to call someone a commie than a Nazi. Because the commies did a lot worse. <laughs> but it's neither here nor there. That's not really... And so then the question, the thing is, is that there were a lot of secular quote-unquote Jews who were behind these movements. <coughs> and that's really what I want to really address here in reference to this comment. Is that... Judaism, and this was the comment I was going to make, this is what I was going to write, I'm already eight minutes, eight and a half minutes into this video, and I really want to make something very short to the point, and I apologize to that, for that, but Judaism is a religion, not a race. Anyone from any race can convert to Judaism. Our president's daughter is Jewish. It has nothing to do with the blood that goes through your veins, it has to do with what you believe. Judaism is a religion. Like any other religion, you know, if someone, uh, if we, we can compare it to other religions. I like to study comparative religion to a certain extent. If somebody uh, doesn't believe in Jesus, they're not a Christian. You know, if somebody doesn't believe Muhammad was a prophet or the last prophet, the greatest prophet, even, I mean, even if he accepts Muhammad as a prophet, he says it to other prophets later. You know, like the Baha'i faith, so then he's not a Muslim. And so therefore, if somebody doesn't believe in the basic dogmas of the Jewish faith, he's not Jewish. Because Judaism is a religion and not a race. And so, you know, just because, and 
So some people are going to answer, but you're born Jewish. If your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. That's what the Jewish law says. Well, so then we can compare it like this. If someone was baptized into the Catholic Church, I myself was baptized in the Catholic Church as a baby. Um, and then they uh, renounce Catholicism and they never continue, they don't go and get their the, the sacraments, which I, I never did, even though I was baptized as a Catholic when I was a baby. I also had a bris, I had both, because my father's Catholic, my mother's Jewish. Uh, but I'm not Catholic, just because I was baptized as a Catholic. But the church might still see me as a quote-unquote lapsed Catholic because I was baptized into the church. And so too, but obviously I'm not Catholic. And I don't you know, represent Catholicism in any way. I am, I'm Jewish, you know, and I, I have nothing, even though I enjoy studying about other religions, and, you know, many people of different religions could enjoy what, say, Bishop Fulton Sheen would say, even if they don't agree with everything he taught. But that being said, it doesn't make me a Catholic either. And, just, and so too, you know, I had a friend, an imam, and he would tell me how he enjoyed the... Uh, Rabbi David Weiss Halivni, uh, Halivni Weiss, um, David Weiss Halivni, enjoyed his his writings. I'm not so familiar with them, so I don't have what to comment on about uh, David Halivni. But I'm just pointing this out that you know, just because someone was quote unquote born into a religion and even brought into the religion doesn't make them part of that religion. And that's really the point what I'm bringing out here. <clears throat> so, just because someone was born Jewish doesn't mean that they continue to be Jewish throughout their life. The only thing in Judaism is that, you know, we do have, there is a difference in Judaism as far as our faith teaches between a Jew and a Gentile. A Jew is required to keep the 613 commandments, the Ten Commandments that are, you know, the Ten Commandments are basically the Ten Categories of the 613 full into. And a Gentile is required to keep the Seven Commandments of Noah, which is really also more similar to the Ten Commandments, in as much that there are seven categories that cover a few dozen of the 613. According to many different interpretations of Judaism, even within, you know, it's not something that's really cut and dry, but it's something that's generally understood and generally accepted, these seven laws of Noah. Uh, if someone is born Jewish, and, or they convert to Judaism, and then they leave the faith, um, they are no longer, they, they do not become a Gentile. Now, they become like a Gentile in certain matters. For example, they might not count for a minion. Um, they might, they, if they touch wine, it's not kosher. However, on the other, not a Gentile in the sense of first and foremost, they're required <coughs> to keep all the laws, the Ten Commandments, keep the Sabbath and so forth, and kosher, laws that Gentiles are not required to keep. And uh, even though, though, obviously, they're not keeping it, they don't believe in it. Or though they might be keeping it, but it's not believing it, that could be a whole question of those type of status. There are people like that. Um, and and they can technically marry someone Jewish, although it's probably not such a good idea. Um, but, you know, they could technically, you know, such a marriage is valid in the sight of Jewish law. Um, is it necessarily the best thing to do? I don't think so, you know, but it, it, I'm just saying the validity according to Jewish law. Those are the differences. But that being said, I often entertain the notion that such a person is a non-Gentile, but also a non-Jew. Uh, their category, because there's nothing wrong to be a Gentile according to Judaism. There's no sin being a Gentile. The righteous Gentiles have a place in the world to come. People, And it would seem that from Rashi it means people of any religion can be considered righteous Gentiles and go to heaven, uh, quote-unquote, for lack of a better term, or receive reward for their good deeds. 
um, whether in this world, the next world, whatever it is. Um, uh, but a, a Jew who is an apostate is has a problem. <laughs> we'll, we'll say it at the very least. So that being said, so let's go a little bit more into what we're discussing here. And my book, and then I think, well, first of all, I'm not even sure that George Soros is really a non-Gentile. <laughs> He's really of Jewish ancestry. Some people say that he lied about that to cover up to, you know, so he wouldn't get in trouble for his, for his work together with the Nazis. Um, but let's say he is Jewish, it doesn't matter, because Judaism is not a race. Anybody of any race can convert to Judaism, and people who are born Jewish <coughs> can leave the faith. They don't become Gentiles, but they are not Jewish either. They're kind of a, a limbo state, you know. Being, they are under obligation to be Jewish, whereas a Gentile has, has the freedom to become Jewish but no obligation to become Jewish. The non-Jew, non-Gentile, the, the Jewish apostate is under obligation to return to Judaism or to embrace Judaism if it, if it was really never there to begin with. We use the term return, but it's, you know, it's, in, in English it's really not apt. So then what is it? You know, what is... So, so what is the answer here? Can a Jew be a Nazi sympathizer? Well, a real Jew cannot be a Nazi sympathizer. But an ex-Jew, or you know, an apostate like George Soros, probably can. He could do whatever the hell he wants, you know? I mean, I, I think there was a movie, Apt Pupil, that said uh, it was about a, a, a Jewish boy, you know, who became a Nazi, a neo-Nazi, and and there is theories that Hitler himself uh, was either Jewish or had some Jewish ancestry. Uh, so then the next question goes. So so the, the answer is. So the question is, can a Jew be a, a, a Nazi sympathizer or a Nazi? And the answer is, he's not really Jewish then, but he's a non-Gentile can be. Uh, now, the Nazis probably won't be too comfortable with that. Um, but it is what it is. You know, it's, it's like what, the, the Black Klansmen, you know, and, and what it was, what's his name, uh, Dave Chappelle, he had the, the, the thing of the blind... Uh, the blind black clansman, right? And he didn't know he was black. Um, now, the next question in this video is, did the Jews cause World War II? You know? And the, the answer is, there's no such thing as, quote-unquote, the Jews. Jews are people like anybody else. They are, except even more so. I mean, Rabbi Daniel Lapin points out very wisely that the Jewish people, quote unquote, are in no way unified. Jews argue about everything. Even Jews who agree on a lot of things argue about everything. And certainly, when we're dealing with issues like this, when we have, you know, people who are apostates, who are, you know, totally, you know, against everything Judaism stands for, they in no way represent the Jewish community and have nothing to do with being Jewish. So there is no such thing as, quote-unquote, the Jews doing anything. There's one time in history when the Jewish people were united, and that was at Mount Sinai. And this is what the, the great Bible commentary Rashi 
which if we want to give him a, a Greek name, I've seen once, you know, because we say Maimonides, Nachmanides, <laughs> you know, Moses, Maimonides, Moses, and Nachmanides. So Rashi would be Rabbi Solomon Isaacides, because his father, his name was Rabbi Yitzchak, so Isaac, so Solomon Isaacides. But I, you never hear people talk about Isaacides, they always say Rashi. But there is no such thing as the Jews. There is nobody who represents all Jews. There is no, there is no such thing as Jewish unity. And I'm kind of happy that there's no such thing as Jewish unity right now, until, you know, we have this, you know, people talk about how Jeremiah, you know, missionaries say that Jeremiah was talking about some new religion when he talked about a new covenant in their hearts. But that's not what it is what he's talking about. He's talking about when our hearts will actually change. When God is going to do a miracle, when the true Messiah comes, and every human being is going to have the law written on their heart. And that's what we're looking forward to. So, where there may be Jews who had something to do with World War II. World War II is something that happened. Nobody caused World War II as a plan. I'm pretty sure, to me, it seems historically accurate to say that, that there is no one who was like, I'm going to sit down and make World War II happen, except maybe Hitler himself, you know, or except, you know, Tojo and Hirohito to get, you know, I mean, Hitler by invading Germany started world, I mean, invading Poland I'm sorry, started World War II, and you know Tojo and Hirohito by uh, attacking Pearl Harbor brought America into World War II you know, and made it essentially a world war I mean you know, that's basically what I can say about this um now, the, the bigger question, though, is were the Jews, or the Zionists, really, behind, first of all, it wasn't the Jews, obviously, but were the Zionists behind the Holocaust, which is an aspect of World War II, but not the totality of what World War II was. And again, there, uh, there isn't exact proof that they exactly caused the Holocaust, but there seems to be a lot of indication that they were very happy with it. They wanted it to happen. They wanted to kill pious Jews. This way the world would have mercy on them, quote-unquote, have pity on them, and give them their state. And they specifically didn't want religious Jews to be in their new state. They wanted it to be a secular state. They hated religion. And so these people, you know, stole our name you know, stole our holy name of the Jewish people, our biblical legacy, and instead turned it into some kind of a racist ideology that has nothing to do with Judaism, although it grabs onto certain Jewish, um, you know, themes and certain whole things that are holy to Judaism, just as, you know, many religions have done and have done a much better job of it, meaning Christianity did the same thing as the Zionists did. They kind of robbed the identity of the Jewish people, but they accomplished a lot of things that Jews were supposed to do, to be a light unto the nations, to bring ethical monotheism to the world. And so, even though I disagree with the theology of Christianity, I thank Christianity for doing the job that we were supposed to do. And, but instead of doing that, what do the Zionists do? They go and huddle themselves into this little ghetto and forget about God. And forget about what the Bible is really all about. And sometimes they'll go and pick up a Bible and wave it around and say, Look, this is ours because the Bible says so and they don't even believe in the Bible. Whereas me, who I do believe in the Bible, what, I, what Christians call the Old Testament, or at least what Protestants call the Old Testament, what, and is part of what Catholics call the Old Testament, uh, you know... I believe in, and I don't consider it old, I consider it totally current and, and modern and, and, and uh, eternal. 
Testament, so that's why I don't like to use the term Old Testament, but it's a colloquialism that people are familiar with. All of that being said, you know, I believe in it, and I don't believe that we should be taking over the Holy Land right now, because I believe I'm waiting for that day, what Jeremiah said, when the law will be placed in our heart. I'm waiting for what uh, Malachi said, that behold, I'll send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Well, Elijah the prophet's not here yet. The Messiah's not here yet. You know, Elijah is going to announce the coming of the Messiah, apparently, even though it's not clearly in the Bible, but the Bible does say that Elijah the prophet will come back before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And although he makes cameo appearances here and there, it would seem, uh, according to our tradition, <coughs> but you don't have this, you know, public display that everybody recognizes. I mean, even if right now Elijah the Prophet would go and make a video on YouTube, people would think it's not really Elijah the Prophet, you know. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. There has to be a change in our hearts. There has to be that new covenant in our hearts, not a new book. That's not what we need. A new a book is not in our hearts. A book is, is a book, you know. So it's it's not just you know a book, you know. And it, all right. So then the Catholics would say, well, we had the you know the the, the church began as a community before we had books, but, you know, before they had the New Testament books, but. To, still, it's it's essentially a book. It, even it, all right, so it's a, you know an oral tradition, but it's not like it's not that the whole world was immediately changed in an instant in their hearts. But still, like I said, Christianity has brought ethics and monotheism to the world, the, the basic ideals of Judaism to the world, and we thank Christianity for that. Maimonides recognizes that that despite how much Jews have suffered under Christians or people professing to be Christians. That's it. Now, um, I mean, and we, you know, we get to what, like, Hitler talked about positive Christianity, where there's nothing positive about it, but, you know, his, his uh, twisted view of Christianity, which is actually, in certain ways, uh, superficially similar to ancient Christian Gnostics, ironically, um, So basically, those are the answers that I have. I know this video is going to get in big trouble. Um, it's already gone for a half hour. But the thing is, is that people making an Eru for this and that, religious Jews who just want to live their religion, keep their faith alive, while we're waiting for the Messiah to come, and who have no political agendas, other than the benefit of everybody and freedom to live how they want, which is going to just benefit everybody. You know, it's ridiculous to in any way compare the construction of a roof to by pious Jews who wouldn't hurt a fly to the. Zionists who have political agendas that are contradictory to um, to the Jewish faith. <clears throat> now, all that being said, that doesn't mean that I'm sympathetic to the quote-unquote Palestinian cause. There was, no, there was no Palestinian country. There was, you know, Palestine is what the British called, you know, the Holy Land. when it was uh, you know when, it, when they had the temporary uh, protectorate status after World War One, and it's a, you know it's an old you know Latin name you know that's not there were no Palestinian people the Arabs who came to Eretz Israel there were very few and uh, most of them only came once the Zionists started to come and Zionists were too lazy to do their own work. 
And so they hired Arabs to do their work. So they came from Egypt and Transjordan, which is now called Jordan. And there were some local Arabs, but not that many. Not, you know... And, you know, it's, you know, this whole idea that, you know, uh, but I think that, you know, still there's a reason why God caused this to happen, and it's in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 33, it says, you angered me with a non-God, and so therefore I'm going to punish you with a non-people. Meaning God basically took this idea of making up a new people, just like the meaning there are no Palestinians, there are Arabs. And there are no Israelis, there are Jews. And so because the Jews abandoned their Jewish heritage and became Israelis, <coughs> and you'll hear secular Israelis talk like that, say, Anilo Yehudi, Ani Israeli. I'm not a Jew, I'm an Israeli. A Jew is, is someone, you know, who's religious, or even if they're not religious, you know, they have this Jewish culture, you know, the, the exile culture, they'll call it, and, you know, I'm an Israeli, I'm not a Jew, you know, and as a punishment for that, for, for that sin of abandoning the faith and abandoning God, so God is punishing the Israelis with Palestinians. You angered me with a non-God, so I angered, you angered me with atheism, and so I'm going to punish you with a non-people. That's what the Bible says, and that's what's happening now. Now, I'm not saying that in any way to deny individual people who identify as Palestinians of their human rights as human beings. I'm talking about their national status as some kind of a different nation. They're, they're first of all, they're basically Jordanians and Egyptians, and, and those national identities are also quite questionable. You know, Jordan is a new country. Egypt, these aren't the, you know, descendants of the pharaoh, you know, these are Arabs also who live in Egypt, which is fine, I still believe that they're human beings who deserve human rights, the question is, this whole question of national sovereignty, and my real answer when it comes to this personally, is that, you know, Israel won a lot of land in 1967 in wars, whether they started, whether the Arabs started, they won. Now, the Israelis don't want to annex the land because then they're going to lose their quote-unquote Jewish majority. Uh, which, it's not so clear if they will or won't, but they won't have such a strong majority as they had. And, you know, they're trying to fool themselves that they could be both a Jewish state and a democratic state. And my feeling is that they should forget about the whole Jewish state thing and focus on democracy. Focus on being a country like America with Jeffersonian freedom of religion and values like that. And that's what, what should be going on. And forget about the whole thing of uh, you know being a Jewish state. But make sure that all the people who live there, Jew and Gentile alike, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, atheist, everybody, Baha'i, whatever you are, Druze, all of them, should all have total equal rights and true religious freedom, not like this British style that they have now in Israel. We have a chief rabbi and the chief mufti, and these are government positions, and, you know, and, and the, the various Christian communities have the Misrata Datot, and, you know, they have their, uh, you know, the ministries of religion and so forth. I think, you know, religion and government should be not totally separate. I think, you know, religious people can have a voice in government. You know, I don't think, I don't believe, like, the way that they have it in France and in Turkey that basically if you're religious you have to be totally separate from the government you have you have to shut up and, and keep it at church that's not what I believe but I do believe that the government shouldn't be bossing around and like licensing you know who's a real religion 
you know, that type of stuff. Um, they can regulate certain aspects, I do believe. You know, you can say, you know, who is a clergy person um, for governmental interaction on the state and local level. The federal level, not, I don't believe. Although, even on the federal level, we also have do have that same thing in America, but still I think the American approach is, is the best approach. Um, so that's basically what I have to say. I mean, you know, things like in New York City, you know, how they regulate who can sign a marriage license, something that I'm going to do in hopefully less than an hour from now. Um, So, um, hopefully I'm making it time. Right now I'm making good time, but I'm not to the city yet. I'm in Jersey now, but I can see the city. I can see the city now. I see the Empire State Building. Picture King Kong climbing up there. So, thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, comment. And I'm going to put this up and share it on that video. I'm sorry it's so long. Uh, I have Logaria, so I have to learn how to make shorter videos. Alright, again, thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, and let's continue the conversation. Alright, um, now, uh, just to, to be clear at the end, I do want, you know, secular Jews to come back to religion. But I think, personally, but until they do, I don't think they should be claiming to be representing Jews in any way. Um, and so in my book, Ivanka Trump is a lot who keeps Shabbos and kosher to the best of her ability. Maybe she messes up once in a while, but she tries very, very much. And someone like Ivanka, but, but she, you know, she prays very fervently. And she's, she's basically a pious Orthodox Jewess, even if she's not perfect. Um, She is much more Jewish than George Soros or, you know, anybody, whoever you want to say it, with Barack or whatever else, you know. You know, Netanyahu is at least somewhat traditional, you know. I can, I'm not going to take away his Jew card just because I disagree with his Zionism. Um, you know, but someone like Ehud Barak, who is an anti-religious person, you know, that's not, you can't compare, um, obviously, you know, and just being a Zionist doesn't make you a good Jew, you know, and that's what a lot of people, they'll, you know, they'll forgive someone who, for breaking Shabbos and eating Chazer because they're a Zionist, and that's not, I, I'm uncomfortable with that, you know, that's a, maybe a lot of religious Zionists will do that, and, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying, Netanyahu is a religious Zionist, but he is a traditional Jew. You know, he said Kaddish for his father, and he keeps holidays and things, and, you know, he does have, and he doesn't just do it for a show, I don't think. I think he really has somewhat of a Jewish heart, even though I'm not a, a, a big fan of neither his policies nor his, nor his Zionism in general. Um, so, just sharing that right now. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, comment, and let's continue the conversation. Um, I know this is going to make people upset, but I think it's a it's an honest conversation. And check out this video uh, that Yaron Ruvain posted and the video of uh, Rabbi Ben Porat because it is. Um, I think it's it's even though. I don't 100% agree with the approach that, that he's taking here. It's true. Uh, it, it, to a certain extent. A lot of the things he's saying is true. And, and essentially, I mean, Rabbi Victor Miller also basically, he wrote a book about this that he never published, but now it's been published. I would suggest to check it out. It's called uh, defense of Hashem in the matter of the Holocaust, of divine madness, 
check out that book. You might not agree with everything, although I pretty much I read it over the, the, during the three weeks, and, it, and it's true. We, the, the vast majority of Jews totally abandoned Judaism, and, and essentially they brought it on themselves. The sad thing, though, is that the pious Jews were also caught up in it, and we see that in, in Rashi, in Parshas Noyach. Look at what Rashi says on, on uh, Genesis 6, 13, I believe it is. I know it's in Genesis 6, where Rashi basically says that once the destruction is let loose, the righteous and the wicked are caught up together in it. All right. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Please like, share, and subscribe, comment. All the best.